Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today for another class. We are going to start a new topic. Don't know how far I'll get in it, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that really impacted my heart and has affected me uh, not in just that area, but has empowered me to uh, really receive uh, all of the inheritance that I have in Christ through just one little simple thing, and I want to talk about that. Um, for many years, uh, I was raised Lutheran, and uh, from the time I could, you know, walk or talk, my mom was telling me I was a sinner going to hell. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that has an impact on you as a young person. <laughs> and then finally, as I grew older, you know, I would, I'd always say my prayers because that's what I was taught before I went to bed. But as I grew up, uh, I began to, like, hear things that I, you know, made sense to me. And at some point when I was a young kid, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight or nine, I, I believed and called on the Lord myself uh, to be saved. But I really didn't understand that until I was in my mid-20s. I didn't, you know, I didn't understand what had happened to me. So, but... Uh, even though I knew that experience, that I had that experience um, where my heart kind of changed. Uh, and this is how I thought, this is why I think that I got saved when I was seven or eight, because after that time, it seemed like when my mom would say I was a sinner going to hell, it didn't have the same impact on me. Like I kind of felt okay. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I screw up, but yeah. Uh, so Anyway, when I got older, I started going to different churches. When I moved away from home, I went to these different churches, non-denominational, some denominational. And uh, I taught Sunday school for a little while for kids. And so, um, but I always had this nagging thing in my mind and heart because, you know, I wasn't converted. I was just a Christian that went to church. That's all I knew. I wasn't baptized in the spirit. I had no power. Um, I had a zeal, like the scriptures say, but not according to knowledge. Uh, I was a very timid person, shy. And so, you know, I did things that were ungodly. I did things that were wrong. And uh, every time I would, I would feel like I'd just hear my mom in the back of my head, you're going to hell. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I struggled, you know, I would... Uh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in my mid-20s. I'd go out and party or stuff, and I'd come home, and I'd find myself like a little kid on my bed, you know, afraid to fall asleep, thinking that I had done something that was going to send me to hell, okay? Now, you know, even though I went to all these different churches, I was probably late 20s when I went to a fellowship where they taught me how to study God's Word they told me that I could actually understand God's word and that the spirit of God wanted to live and abide in me and empower me to be a minister to other people, the things I learned. Wow, I was like, I'll take two, <laughs> you know? And so I got baptized in the spirit and uh, my whole world changed in the sense that I could see Christ working in me. I could see it working in me. But I was still plagued by this unstable thinking about, man, am I saved? You know, did I blow it somewhere along the way? Or uh, do I have to live a certain way? Or the Spirit's going to leave me now? And I was already legalistic in my thinking because I was Lutheran, <laughs> you know? And uh, so anyway, I, I did what every self-respecting Christian would do. I bought commentaries to understand what God was trying to tell me. <laughs> so I bought all these commentaries. And you know the thing about commentaries is they're very convincing. That's why the person wrote it, okay? So I got one on this, on the subject, on each side of the subject, okay? One, no, you can't lose your salvation. Oh, yes, you know. And they used the same scriptures. It drove me crazy. And every time I would finish reading a commentary, a book, an article about it, I would be persuaded that it was there the way they said. So I got so like, 
I felt like James described it. I felt like uh, a wave of the sea tossed with every wind of doctrine. And I'm like, you know what, Father, this has to end because the enemy was really hindering me from uh, letting him, f- the spirit flow through me because I was always conscious about whether I was right with God or not in that sense. And, you know, you might think of, I always think of uh, Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about what we call the armor. And it says that it refers to the, the helmet as salvation, okay? Now, you know, that uh, it can, that the word that's used there can mean like the born again experience or the being sealed by the Spirit. Uh, but, uh, and if you use it in that sense, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because if your mind is not guarded, if you're not protected about who you are in Christ, that your relationship is secure, that's a weak area for you. And it, you become very vulnerable because, you know, it's, I know it's just an analogy, but it's like you think with your mind. We always think you think with your mind. So, if your mind isn't thinking right, what's going to happen? Okay, no time for testimonies. Come on. <laughs> but no, it's going to be hard for you. And that's what I found. Even though I was baptized in the Spirit, I had moments of boldness. I was never settled in my mind or heart. So I, dis- I made this decision one day. I said, you know what, Father? I said... Um, I said, I'm just going to have to choose to believe your word because I'm never going to have peace unless I just choose to believe what you show me your word means. Okay, so I did. I I just committed that if it says it this way and it's supported by the mouth of two or three witnesses from Genesis to Revelation, then I'm just going to accept that. And I was like, What I struggled with for like, I'd say from my early 20s, probably seven or eight years, tormented with this, you know, indecision in my mind, was settled in about two or three months of going through the Word. Just completely, I was at peace. And I knew, wow, this is God's answer. Now, this is how important it is. Okay, this is why I'm relating this story. When I was very, very sick, Uh, towards what I call the end of my journey, like seven and a half years into my journey, all that legalism that I had in my life was keeping me sick. And uh, it did just move, like we were talking about earlier, it just moved from insecurity about salvation to insecurity about what I need to do to be pleasing to God, okay? And so I was tormented with that. And I knew it was demonic, but I didn't understand how it was working. So anyway, seven and a half years into my journey, I've shared this many times before, is I read a scripture, Matthew 21, verse 22. It's a parallel to Mark 11. uh, And, you know, I read that, I must have read that scripture a thousand times, but this day I read it, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believing you receive. And that day I read it backwards. And I do that a lot with the scriptures, you know. It's like, um, remember when you're in grade school and they'd have A plus 1 equals 2, and how would you get what A was? Well, you'd subtract 1 from 2 and you'd get A equals 1. So, uh, yeah, that's a revelation for some of you out there. (laughs) But That's called mathematical formulas. (laughs) Elementary, if I might add. Anyway. So um, I would do that with the scriptures because I would say, well, how did it get, how does it get to this point? And then I would back into it and I would, you know, the spirit would teach me by, because that's the way I learned. I've always been backwards. But anyway, so that day I read that scripture this way. If you have received, you have believed. And wow, I was confronted there with a very strong dilemma. If I admit that I haven't received, which it was obvious I hadn't received, then I would have to admit that I hadn't believed. Now, I'm sure all your minds are going the same place mine did, was like, wow, if you're in unbelief, you cannot be healed. You know, 
And uh, so I'm thinking to myself, wow, if I say that, that's a deal breaker with God. But you know what? The, our Father is so loving. In that moment, He reminded me of John 8, 32. He said, and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And I said, wow. So I was just honest. I said, Father, I haven't received, which means I haven't believed. And uh, I, instead of feeling the, you know, the sky fall or the lightning bolt hit, I felt free. I really did. I felt like free, but I'm here, I'm still sick as a dog, and, and, uh, but I felt free, free enough to ask this question or make this statement. I said, Father, I guess I don't know how to believe. And immediately he brought to my remembrance that experience that I just shared with you about settling the issue about my eternal security. And not so much that I was eternally secure, but the process of him teaching me uh, and letting the word speak louder than how I felt or what I knew in my own mind. And that's what he was saying. When I did that, I learned or I exercised belief in something I couldn't hear, see, smell, touch, or taste. And also all those senses giving me contrary information that made me feel condemned. Okay? And I realized in that moment, wow, that's how simple it is to receive belief is to just make a decision to accept the Word of God as the only authority on the subject, whether you have feelings contrary to it or whether they're in total agreement with. Amen? Now, that is so important, okay? And uh, I was thinking about this topic that I want to talk about today because if the enemy can get into your mind or get into your heart, however you want to put it, uh, to where you are uncertain, where you have a lack of confidence in your relationship with God, that's going to hinder you from receiving whatever is part of that relationship. Everything, okay? In other words, uh, the healing, which is part of relationship, it's not part of fellowship. It's part of relationship. If that isn't sealed in your mind and heart, the enemy has an area of weakness that he's going to exploit in your life and weaken your confidence when you have evidence that's speaking louder to you than what the Word is saying to you about your situation, okay? You know, how many of us have had a physical challenge and first scripture comes to our mind is 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that ye being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed, right? That comes to our mind, right? But what does that mean? See, Peter in the same breath connected our eternal security with our physical deliverance. The spiritual part with the physical part. Where did he get that idea? Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, that tells us that not only Jesus did Jesus bear uh, our iniquities, our transgressions, bore the chastisement of our peace, but with his physical stripes, he made a way for us to embrace the physical healing as well. He made healing part of the redemption that we have in Christ. Amen? But if the enemy can get you in your mind and heart to be insecure about your relationship, what do you think that's going to do to your confidence when you're being steadfast on a symptom that you're having in your body? What do you think that's going to do? It's going to undermine it, okay? And it might work like this. Um, well, look what you said to so-and-so. Are you really saved? If you were, you'd probably already be healed. You know what I mean? And all of us have had those thoughts, and many of us dismiss them, and uh, we just say, oh, well, that's not true. I called on the Lord when I was eight years old, you know, or whatever. We have uh, some kind of response. But yet, what hangs there still? The uncertainty, the insecurity about 
uh, is that really a done deal, you know? And uh, I'm gonna throw this in, I'll get to it later, but I remember that when I received healing, after this issue was settled in my heart, after the end of that eight years, uh, I remember having this conversation with God, which, which was a fruit of understanding that I was eternally secure with Him. And I think it's important to share this now, is, uh, you know, I had the Abraham conversation with God, but not about Lot or somebody else I knew. I had it about me, okay? And I said, you know, I felt so free because I knew that what Christ did was eternal and it was unbreachable that I was seated with Him, that the security of my status with Him rests in what Jesus has already accomplished for me and not what I will do, good or bad, uh, you know, uh, ill intent or not ill intent. My status is secure because of what Christ did for me. And my, our Father placed me and you in Christ Jesus so that our status could never be altered by our behavior. So our Father is not evaluating us by that behavior. Therefore, my status, your status, uh, cannot change because of what Christ has done for us. Because remember, I was very legalistic, and everything I did, I'm thinking that it's affecting my relationship with God, not understanding uh, the difference between relationship and fellowship, behavior, and status with God. That really assured my heart. And uh, not from a relationship standpoint, as you might have thought, but from a fellowship standpoint, okay? Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, I know you're all familiar with 1 John, uh, the book of 1 John, and I love it. But in 1 John, let's go there to chapter one. I think this is important. Uh, I'm gonna lay this foundation first. And I think it's important, the point that First John, that John is making to communicate to us here. And, um, and I can see that this is, uh, okay, here we go. I'm going to start in verse, verse 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. Now, if you stop there, most of us would look up, everybody. Most of you would think he's talking about his physical relationship with Jesus. His hands handled. Uh, he said he looked upon and his eyes have seen. But notice the next verse, the next phrase. Of the word of life. That's what they handled, saw, experienced, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare unto you that you also, listen carefully, may also have relationship with us. Fellowship. No, it says fellowship. Fellowship is different than relationship. When you, when you were conceived in your mother's womb, relationship began. Now, what you did with that after you got older and grew up was entirely up to your will. True? You could choose to have relationship with you, I mean, uh, fellowship with your parents, or you could not choose. True? You could grow up and like your parents, or you could grow up and hate your parents. True? That's what John is communicating to us. He says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. I want to remind you that the writer here also was the one who wrote the Gospel of John, okay? And if you think about this, 
This is the point that Jesus made, not about relationship, but about fellowship. Just very quickly, uh, turn there with me to um, John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, Jesus is talking about uh, the, he's referring to the relationship that those which have believed on him have. And then he talks about living that life. And I'm going to jump right into the middle of it. And he says verse um, in verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So the abiding is like remaining or continuing in. In fact, it's translated, that word uh, abide is translated remain or continue throughout the book of John in those different ways. It's the same Greek word. I, I don't recall. I think it was me. Mimi or something like that. It's a, yeah, don't quote me on that. Anyway, it says in verse six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, I I remember growing up and just shivering, you know, when I would read that because I'd be concerned. Wow, if I don't toe the line, I'm going to be cut off from the tree and cast out into a fire. And what do you think of? You know, you think of, the everlasting fire, the burning torment of hell, you know? So anyway, he goes on down, notice his next statement. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Now is a disciple the same thing as a child? It can be, but not necessarily. You can be a child of God, but not be a disciple. True? A disciple is a taught or a trained one. That's like a literal definition. Uh, Is someone that's been taught or trained in the Word of God. Now listen carefully what he says. He says, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue you in my love. See, that's a choice there. This is the same, this is the exact same point that John is making in 1 John when he's talking about, hey, what he's writing unto them in 1 John is about having fellowship with the Father, just like he's having fellowship with the Father. And how did he do that? Well, the same way Jesus describes here. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Not if you keep my commandments, then I'll love you. No. He said, if you you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. And I'm not teaching on this. I just want to show you the relationship here, the connection here. It says, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So however Jesus was having fellowship with His Father, who He was the only begotten Son of, He's saying we can have that same kind of fellowship that Jesus had, okay? Now, it wasn't based on relationship. It was based on fellowship. Remember, and this might sound heretical, is that that such a word to many people, but uh, Jesus had the choice to choose to follow his Father's will or not. And probably the most convincing truth in the word that that is a fact is that Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And unless he was, he could not have been our substitute. He could not have borne or taken our place in judgment if he wasn't the same. As, you know, there was an Old Testament scripture. It was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. It had to be like That's why in uh, Hebrews, it says that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Why? Because it wasn't a life for a life. In a way, it was a life for a life, but it wasn't the life of a man for the life of a man. It wasn't a soul for a soul uh, concerning man. That's why animal sacrifices only atone. They only covered. The word atonement means a covering. 
So they only covered our sins. And that's why it says in Hebrews over and over, we're going to get to that in a moment, uh, that uh, they could never take away the consciousness of sin. They could never purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God because it wasn't a life for a life. It wasn't a soul for a soul. And Jesus was the only man, as he said himself, he was the only man that qualified, was qualified to take our place. Amen? Are you tracking with me? That's important to the point that I'm going to get to. Okay? So listen to what he says. Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. In other words, it had a choice to go or a choice to stay. If they did what? If they adhered or chose to accept the things that was Jesus was saying for themselves. And then he says this. He says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. See, this is the point that John is making. And I'm not teaching on relationship fellowship, but this would be a good start. <laughs> uh, but what he's saying here is that we choose, we choose to live, when we choose to live in the commandments, we're choosing as Jesus chose to live in his Father's word. When we choose to live in the Father's word, we have, get the same results. But it's a free will choice. And then he says, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, and that what? Your joy might be full. So when, you, when we are born again in Christ, everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us. But how do we become a partaker of that? Do we just have it automatically and we see it manifesting in our life regardless of what we choose to do? No, because that would be manipulation. That would be an imposition on us. But God has given us and honors us with, our, with a free will, a choice in everything that we choose to do. Amen? Now, that's important to understand. Uh, that, that point right there was so freeing for me because I began to see the separation in the verses of the Bible that I was reading that for most of my life had been uh, created fear and condemnation because I wasn't rightly dividing between what was fellowship and what was relationship. How many of you have had that same challenge? I think everyone in this room has had that same challenge. But when I had that conversation with my father, uh, it, uh, it wasn't like I was relying on what the, you know, what I saw him saying to me, like your status can't change unless Jesus' status changed. It was all these scriptures began to fall into line. Okay. In other words, the line upon line, the precept upon precept, the here little and there little began to come together to make this picture of this security that I have. But along with that security that I have as far as relationship, I also have a freedom to choose to fellowship with my father and his son, Jesus Christ, or not. It's still up to me. Amen? And uh, so once we understand that, it makes it so much easier to understand what I'm about to get into concerning the scriptures on uh, the security that we have and the salvation that we have received from a relationship standpoint. Amen? So let me uh, go to, let's just start in uh, 1 Peter. There's many places I could go, but let's just start there. 1 Peter 3. Now again, when you read uh, Peter, the book of Peter, in fact, all the books, except for Paul. I never really had the challenge with the epistles from Paul that I had from James, uh, John, and Peter. Was, uh, and I think because Paul had this revelation about, because he was so works and law oriented 
that when he saw that Jesus had accomplished and secured salvation for him, something he could not do on his own, he saw that it was impossible through works or performance to attain relationship with God. In fact, he says it in Romans chapter 10. He says that he, his heart, he had a zeal for his brothers and sisters, the Israelites. But he said they had a zeal, but not according to knowledge, that they by their works were going about to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting themselves unto the righteousness of Christ, which we receive by faith. And he, I mean, it's like, I can just see him. He was probably so delighted, like, wow, I don't have to work like this anymore. You know, where like Peter, James, and, uh, you know, John, if you don't understand the relationship part being secure, you can read those books and they are, can be challenging. You know, where you feel like, wow, the burden is of performance is on me to be accepted. So having said this, listen to this, this verse here. I'm going to, let's see, um, I'm just going to kind of jump into it. Uh, Let's see. I'm going to try and make this short. Okay, I'll just read verse 18. It says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So how many times can Christ be offered for any sinner? One time. Okay, that's why I'm holding my finger up. Just one time. That's it. Okay. Uh, This will make it more clear. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. This is probably one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. In fact, this was the verse that I was meditating on when I... uh, when I talked... Uh, to the Lord like I did about that. There we go. So in um, 10, I want to read into it a little bit bit, bit here. Uh, Let's start in verse 9. It says, and he said, lo, wow, let's start in 7. He said, then said I, this is Jesus, and it's quoted, I believe, from Psalms 40, I'm guessing. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of a book it is written, uh, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, lo, I come, in, I come to do thy will, O God, He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Now think about this. This is is so important from a law perspective. If Jesus is saying, prophetically, David recorded it. If Jesus is saying when he came, he came to do the will of God, that means up to that time, the will of God had not been done. True? Or that there was a greater will that God had for Jesus to fulfill that hadn't been done yet. Amen? So listen to what he says. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. How many times was Christ offered? Once, just one time. And it says this, And every priest standing daily, ministering, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, there are, I should bring this out, there are some other translations that change the literal uh, meaning of these words in verse 14, and they say, He hath perfected forever them that are being sanctified, instead of are sanctified. 
And I understand why the translators may have done that, because they thought like I did. They didn't really understand the separation between relationship and fellowship. So when they translated it, they were probably like, well, that can't be that we're sanctified yet. <laughs> you know, we still need some work here and we're translators, so we must, we're holier than the rest of the world. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? And they didn't feel right about it either. So, but this is where you have to choose to believe what the word of God is saying. And even if you want to tear this verse apart, it, Sanctified means sanctified. It means set apart. It doesn't mean going to be someday when your works are perfected. No. Who did the perfecting? The one offering that was offered. Amen? For by, what's it say there? For by one offering, he, who? Jesus hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So who did the sanctifying, us or the work of Jesus Christ? It was the work of Jesus Christ. So it was his offering that set us apart for what? Relationship with God. Because apart from that separation, we could not have relationship with God. That's why if you read on, in fact, I will since it's right here. <clears throat> It says, wherefore the Holy Ghost is a witness for us. After that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I what? I remember no more. So this is a verse you need to memorize to uh, share with your wife or your husband or your husband, because they're always reminding you of your yeah. sin. <laughs> Say, boy, I'm glad you're not like Jesus. <laughs> Amen? But what does this say? That he will remember it no more. Now listen carefully. I have a whole teaching on this that I encourage you to, to go to my website. I wrote an article on it, and I also taught on it. It's called uh, Hebrews 10.26. And it, it explains why, I'll re, uh, in a minute, I'm going to get up to there, but I encourage you to listen to that teaching because it's complementary to what I'm sharing today. And I was so challenged by Hebrews 10.26, I'm telling you, it was, it was part of the torment that the devil used to keep me from walking in freedom. Yeah, kind of like that. I'll read it here in a second. But it says... Now, where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, wait a minute. We're going to read some verses in a moment that you're going to think to yourself, well, who's right? Which one of these verses is right? Well, let me tell you, they're both right. But if you have the same mindset that I had, where I'm thinking that my relationship with God hinged on my performance, then you're going to have that same division in your mind when you go to rightly divide these scriptures. And it's going to be, at the very best, it's going to be unsettling to you. But if you're like I was, it was torment. Let me read on just for a second here. I'm going to skip down to verse uh, 26. For if we sin willfully... After we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That used to make the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I'm serious. It really, really bothered me because I don't know about you, but every once in a while I sin. And I've discovered that all sin is willful. <laughs> Nobody sins by accident. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all willful. So if you're if you're on the if you just had the hair on the back of your neck stand up, I encourage you to go to my website and read that article and you'll see from the word line upon line, precept upon precept, g give your heart an opportunity for the spirit to quicken to your heart the truth of what this verse is really saying. And it, it what it's saying is actually true. There is no there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. 
And I'm going to leave you hanging there so you go read the article. So the point I wanted to make here in Hebrews is it's the same point that Peter is making when he made the point that it was one offering. That's it. Just one offering. Now there's going to be a test later and it's only going to have one question. And it's going to say, how many times does Jesus need to be offered for your sin to sanctify you? How many times? Hey, no cheating. (laughs) Quit looking at your neighbor's finger. (laughs) You got your own. (laughs) So now think about that for a minute. Now, these two verses make it very clear, but we're going to, as we go on, we're going to see even more, okay? I was trying to think of one that, uh, I don't know if I wrote it down here or not, but there was one that goes along with that that's so beautiful. Uh, Yep, here it is. Um, Well, not really. That's not the one I was thinking of. Anyway, but I'll go there. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Let's see, where is it? Wow, these are some of my favorite verses here. Uh, And again, uh, if you read this and you don't remind yourself that what John is talking about here is how to have fellowship. He's not discussing your relationship. He's talking about fellowship with God, okay? So important, because if you start applying these to relationship, man, you won't even be safe if you lock yourself up in a room and and with nothing in the room, but you know, you. (laughs) You're still gonna have a problem with maybe I sinned. Okay, and maybe uh, I'm in trouble. But you have to understand that point. It's so important. So I'm going to read into this again. Uh, Just I think it's important. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. uh, Verse 8, we'll start with that. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. Let me hang, let that hang there for a minute. Has anyone sinned? (laughs) Now, how does that make you feel? (laughs) <laughs> so maybe your wife is right. You're of the devil. <laughs> no. What's he saying here is the question. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Isn't that beautiful? You know, for years, if, if somebody would have asked me, what was the purpose that Jesus came to the earth? I would say, well, God so loved the world that he sent him to be my savior. But is that what this verse says? No, this verse says, for this purpose was he manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. That's profound, folks. Okay? So when someone tries to convince you that your leg is just a physical problem that you're having, remind them of this verse, and it'll stir you up to speak against the problem that's in your wife's leg, and it will leave. Amen? Okay, let's go on here. Um, Oh, this is what I want to get to. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Wait a minute. This would almost sound confusing. He who commits sin is of the devil? And now he says that if if you're born of God, you don't commit sin? Wait a minute. Are you really saved? Have you been born of God? Huh? Now, look up. Be honest. Doesn't that make you pause for a moment? Why would it make you pause? Because you're not sure. You don't have certainty. I can read these verses now without blinking because I understand what they're talking about. Okay? 
Now, much of the ministry I do, people are bound with these kind of, of issues because they don't have this question settled in their heart about relationship. So they never have confidence towards God. Listen to this. This is in the same chapter. He says here in verse, um, uh, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, we have confidence towards God. Wow. Do you see why the enemy is constantly trying to undermine your confidence in the scriptures, in truth, in what the word says has been done in your life? Because if he can do that, if he can access your heart, what's going to follow the rest of your life? Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with all diligence, not some, not just a little bit, but with all diligence. Why? For out of it flow the issues of life. That's why the enemy starts with thoughts, because those thoughts, if they're not captured and brought into obedience to the word of truth, line upon line, precept upon precept, they're going to sink down into your heart. And they're going to divide away from you confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And you'll be constantly picking your helmet up, putting it on, trying to protect yourself. And you know what you won't be able to do because you're worried about your helmet? You're going to not be able to fight those coming against you. You're not going to be able to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And your shield of faith is going to be, it's going to be like a screen with big holes in it. <laughs> you know, everything's going to go through and hit you right away. The shield is to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, which are what? They're thoughts. That's what they are. But if the enemy can sink a thought into your mind to where you're thinking, wow, Maybe I'm not saved yet, or maybe that's why I haven't been healed yet, because I'm really not saved. I just think I'm saved. I love the Lord. I think I do. You know, I sing. I get blessed when I worship the Lord in praise and worship. But gosh, Joe last week said he never was saved, and yet he's been in the band for years, the Christian band. He said he never called on the Lord to be saved himself. Think about that. Those are thoughts that the enemy uses. How do I know? I didn't stay six for seven and a half years because I had confidence towards God. It's because I had no confidence towards God. But folks, you can ask my wife. I put on a good face. I had a good game going. I fooled a lot of people, but I didn't fool myself. Deep down in my heart, my heart was right there doing what? For if our heart condemn us, and I forgot the next part, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. But beloved, if our heart condemn us not, we have what? Confidence towards God. Amen? That is awesome. So what am I leading to? Turn with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. This is all part of the um, the relationship that uh, I want to talk about and have actually been talking about. These are some beautiful verses here. And uh, I think I will charge, start in... Uh, Wow. I don't want to open another can of worms. But I have a teaching on this as well. Um, I'm going to just start in verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, 
according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purchased, purposed in Himself, that in the disp dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him, in whom we have obtained inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Wow, have you ever stopped and caught that phrase? God trusted first in Christ. Wow. You know, I guess if you're a parent, you might, um, you might know what this feeling is. You know, uh, like, uh, you know, I have this towards my wife. It's like, I trust her in certain things. Like, I can give her something to do or ask her to do something, and I have complete confidence, even though I know she's capable of erring or making mistakes, I know that she's going to get that done, that she's going to do it. It's going to be done with excellence. And she might come to me and ask me for help along the way, but I trust that she is going to complete it uh, to my satisfaction. Do you know this is the same feeling that the father had in his own son? He put his trust in Jesus that Jesus would accomplish what he taught him and called him to fulfill. Think about that. Isn't that beautiful? You know what? It emphasizes to me what the scriptures are very clear on, that Jesus had a free will, that he could have chosen to just live after the flesh like we, we can choose, but he didn't. He chose not to. Now listen to this. That, the reason I brought that out, because it's important to this next phrase, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Wow. Do you know that word sealed there has the, um, the definition of like hermetically sealed? How many of you have heard that phrase? hermetically sealed. In other words, there's nothing that can get past that barrier. It's, it's impossible to go beyond that barrier. Like, um, I'm trying to think, you know, something mechanical like uh, a compressor uh, on an air conditioning system is hermetically sealed. In other words, there's no air that can pass into that system once it's been closed there's no way to connect, contaminate the system because it is sealed. There's no air can pass through the barrier even of you know, the copper tubing uh, or the aluminum uh, fins. It can't penetrate without there becoming a hole first. You have to have a way in. But this says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise here. Uh, isn't that awesome? And listen carefully, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You know, this is no different than uh, the earnest money that one would put down on a house. You know, how many of you know what earnest money is? Anybody that's bought a house? Uh, and that money, even though it's not equal to the purchase of the price of the house, like let's say you're you know, well, we're in Colorado Springs, so you're buy buying a one-bedroom, one-bath home, $300,000. Uh, <laughs> you, you might just put down $3,000, but the price is $300,000. But you know what? No one can buy that house from underneath you. No one. They could come in and offer $400,000 for that home, and they cannot buy it. Do you know why? Because once... Once the seller receives your earnest money, that contract is sealed for you until it goes through all of its vetting process 
And if, you know, if you get through that vetting process and now uh, you qualify to buy the house, then that $3,000 held it for you. And now you got to pay the full amount. Amen? That's exactly why the Father gave His Spirit. It seals us. And it says, until when? Until when? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. You know, the redemption there, that the word redemption means a loosing away. So we're in mortal bodies right now. And, and it's all over the scriptures. It says that our bodies are not redeemed, that they are just sealed and uh, by the Spirit. And it's the Spirit that's giving life to them to fulfill the promises that God has given us, as, such as the promise of life, uh, Psalms 90, 10, or just one example, uh, <clears throat> where we have this assurance of life. It's the Spirit that causes that to be fulfilled, not our diet, uh, you know, not our exercise, not anything else. It's, it's the Spirit of God, our cooperation with that Spirit, that the Spirit is free to release that uh, promise in our life. But the, it's still a mortal body. But one day, we're, these bodies are going to, we're going to be loosed away from these physical mortal bodies, and we're going to put on immortality just as Christ has put on an immortal body. Amen? And that's what this is talking about. So you're sealed until that exchange happens. Why? Because we're still in the flesh, okay? And the flesh is corruptible. How many would you agree? <laughs> yes, totally corruptible, okay? Now, let's go and look at a... a uh, a supporting verse to this. It's also in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Now again, the writer here, in, in chapter 1, okay, in chapter 1, um, the whole emphasis being made there is about the preposition in. He uses that phrase so many times in chapter one. He's talking about where we have been placed because we have believed that we're in Christ. Ephesians chapter two, he said, we're seated with him in heavenly places. Okay. And then he says this. Um, so when you get to this point, you have to ask yourself this question. Wait a minute. I'm going to read a few verses. Wherefore, verse 25 of chapter four. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. See, you can be angry if you want, just don't sin. <laughs> okay. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Do you know what that statement means right there? If you are to neither give place to the devil, that means you can give place to the devil. Whose choice? ours. And then it says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the edit, to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. You know what I love about this verse? It makes the same point as in uh, Ephesians 1.13, but it also says you can even grieve the Holy Spirit, but you'll still be sealed until the day of redemption. Isn't that beautiful? Amen? That is so awesome. It reminds me of, uh, go to uh, John 10. This is, this is awesome. Okay, John 10, where is it? Um, 
Oh yeah, this is good. John 10 verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them temporary life and they shall maybe perish. Neither shall some or maybe man pluck them out of my hand. These are the words of Jesus, okay? Now, it was Jesus just a little confused when he used those, uh, those terms, eternal, never, no one? No. Let's just believe Jesus. See, that's what I had to do, folks. Remember I told you at the beginning about reading all those commentaries? See, I had to make a choice to believe that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that he was the truth. And that when he said, uh, speaking to his father, he said, thy word is truth. I had to say, okay, if his word is truth, then I can just believe what he says. I don't have to doubt it or be confused. I can just accept it. So listen to what he says. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. What's difficult to understand about that? Never perish? What does that mean? Well, I've read many things that that means that aren't true. But I mean, you have to be a theologian to really mess this up. (laughs) You know, he says, uh, neither uh, shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know, I was taught growing up, well, you can pluck yourself out of your hand. But then I asked the question, but I'm a man. And it says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So am I included in the man there? Yes, I'm included in the man there. That means I cannot pluck myself out of the Father's hand. Amen? He says, my Father which gave them me, listen carefully, is greater than all. Jesus was saying, my Father is greater than me, and listen to what he can do. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Are you feeling a little safer now? (laughs) You should be. If you're in the Father's hand, it's going to take more than the devil to get you out of there. Amen? Now, you might feel like you're not in the Father's hand because of something you've done or been accused of or how you were raised or some other lie. But if you've ever been placed in the Father's hand, you can never be plucked out. And you can never just decide to walk out. Amen? Because he's the one deciding He's the one that's holding. So folks, I'm out of time. Uh, I wanted to continue on. There's a verse I wanted to get to that is very controversial. But uh, our Father, just put it on my heart to lay this foundation first. And uh, so once you see that verse in context of what you hear, it's easier to choose to believe the truth than it is to just jump right into that verse. And I know what happens is right away all your knowledge jumps up in your head and you can't hear clearly. So this is a good way to do it. I was blessed this morning when uh, these scriptures came to my mind how to uh, lay lay this out. So we're going to get to that verse in the next uh, class. So please join me and uh, have an awesome rest of your day.